I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino. This is the Streamlined Connection on Bold Brave TV Network. And I'm excited that today we're going to be talking a bit about how to bring more joy to your work um, and how to make everything kind of work together so that your habits help you um, create more focus in both your work and your life. But I want to tell you a little bit about the Streamlined Connection for those of you that, that don't know. Um, I discovered that many people don't realize that there is an, a piece of being organized that actually helps you create freedom, um, wealth, and prosperity in your life. And so organizing is probably more important than you think. And the stress you feel in your life, most of it has to do with some aspect of not being organized. And so it's more than just being tidy. It's about creating those connections so that you have the control you crave and the freedom you seek happening at the same time as easily as possible. Organization is a powerful tool that helps you get control and live the life you really want to be living. It controls the actual external physical space, but it also can help you control your internal um internal space as well. So our mindset, our mental model, it go, it plays a role in how we process information and how we re react to organizing and, and disorganizing. And it's all about helping your internal and your external lives match each other so that there's more continuity, less stress, more freedom. Um, and because I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, it will help you scale your business, make more money, work less, have more fun, all those great things. So we talk about how all the aspects of our life work together to help us live the life we'd really like to be living. Um, understanding that connection between mindset, simplicity, and focus, just make it all easier. So today's episode is really important in terms of the how to create focus and alignment between your beliefs, your actions, um, and your desires so that everything can work together. Um, some of these things I've touched on in previous episodes, and so don't think I'm just repeating myself. I like to say things in different ways so that it resonates with more of you, and sometimes you just need some repetition to create an aha moment for yourself. And for those of you that don't know who I am or don't know enough about me, <laughs> I'm actually a certified professional organizer. That means I sat for a test, I know my stuff, all aspects of how organizing works and how to transfer those skills to um, other people. I'm also a money breakthrough business coach, so I've been studying a lot about that connection between how our habits affect our productivity and our ability to make money and how that in turn leads to more clutter, so that interaction. I'm all about the connections. That's why it's called the Streamlined Connection. Um, my company is more than organized, and I actually help entrepreneurs and other busy professionals help um, I help them create that environment that allows them to do the work they want to do in the easiest way possible. All right, so let's talk about how all of this comes together um, and, and how you can start figuring out how to make your work more enjoyable. How many of you have ever actually thought through what aspects of work you enjoy? Have you thought about it ever? I hadn't until one day I thought, I should see what I want to be when I grow up. I had already been in the workforce for about 12 years at that point, and I suddenly realized I wasn't thrilled with my job and thought I might want to work for myself. So I started doing the inventories. It's always a great idea to start by orienting yourself as to where you are. And then figuring out some aspirations. So this first step about figuring out how you like to work and what aspects of work you like, and I've never met anyone that once we started looking into it, didn't like any aspect of work and just wanted to sit like a blob on the couch all day. I mean, it sounds really good until you realize that it's actually kind of nice to move your body around or use your brain for something occasionally. So think about the jobs you've had. It may not be your current job. It may be work you've done in a volunteer position. It may be some project from school in elementary school. What aspects of work do you like? Most of my clients love collaborating, 
A few of them love checking things off a list. Some of them like creating something brand new and bringing it to light. Um, I have one client that loves launching things, doesn't really necessarily love finishing those things or working with them long term. So she starts them, sells them, moves on to the next thing. It's fascinating. Um, I happen to really like bringing ideas into the world and helping make connections for people between how they think and what they do. So it all worked out perfectly. But there's going to be some things that you don't love about work. And you need to note those as well as the things you really love so that we can start doing less of what you don't like and more of what you do. Um, also, it just becomes easier. Maybe there's some stuff at home. Okay, what if you weren't going to work? What would you be working on? Do you want to do more reading and exploring Uh do you want to go on more adventures? Do more hiking? Do you want to do more cooking? What is it about cooking, let's say, that you could apply to different kinds of work or the job you currently have? How can you bring that sense of accomplishment and creation, a little bit of mess and regroup and voila, something magical happens when you put something in the oven? How do you bring that to work? What are the feelings that come with the tasks you're working on that make it so enjoyable and satisfying for you? Think about it. I bet you haven't, or at least not very much. We tend to go into a career that is going to make us money or is related to what we studied in college or what um, our parents expected of us. But what if you got to, got to create that? Turns out my favorite job besides working for myself was unloading trucks as an inventory control person at a re large retail store. I got to actually physically move. I got to check things off a list and I got to um, do a little bit of quiet work alone, but also interact with other people. And it let me feel strong and in control. So notice what you like to work on and make that more often. We got to take a quick break, but we'll be back. The free one minute mail solution works for email too, and you can download it at the link below or over there. Maybe it's a, the link. We are talking today about how to create more focus and joy in your work um, and how to use habits to help that happen more easily. And with everything, we start with getting oriented. So we talked a little bit about figuring out what you actually enjoy about the work you do and what kinds of tasks bring satisfaction to your work. Um, the next step is kind of what you might aspire to. What would successful work look like to you? What does success look like? You know, this can be hugely different for people. It can be just enough to do this, or it could be, I want to own a town, or I want to rule the world. Where, where do you want to be? Do you want to just rule your local area? Do you want to make an impact? Do you want to help people? Define what specifically success looks like to you. And that way, you know what you're working towards. You have to have an end goal, a desired outcome. And it's really helpful between these two exercises, figuring out what brings you satisfaction in your work and what you'd like to have different in your life. You can start bringing the things that feel good into that process so that you can create more success. You can enjoy success quicker because you will have those feelings that come with the success you seek before you've actually arrived there. You will start feeling pieces of that success along the way. So let's say you do wanna open a bakery. You will still feel the success of making a beautiful um, cupcake before you actually open the bakery. You can get that by just making some cupcakes this weekend, right? But once it's open and you're sharing it with the public and you're a success in how that presentation happens and how smoothly the business runs and how you get to enjoy your creations and seeing the, the joy that you bring to your customers, um, the joy on their face when they bite into one of your lovely cupcakes. That's that kind of trajectory of how it works. So you bring in more of the little bit of feeling and it leads to more of that feeling and more of it and more of it and more of it. Um, I find a lot of my clients 
who tend to be entrepreneurs and artists um, or some sort of business owner come at it with, uh, I have to do all these things so I can't possibly do the parts I enjoy. And then they don't really enjoy the work and then it doesn't really go anywhere because they aren't experiencing those little milestones of satisfaction along the way. So really think about who and how you wanna be. It's an interesting distinction, but who you wanna be comes with a set of behaviors and characteristics that lead to how you wanna be and how you wanna be perceived by the outside world. Do you want to be someone that's really reactionary and yells a lot, or do you wanna be someone that is soothing, calm, always seems to be in control and does things effortlessly? You know, what is that outside vision um, that you might wanna portray? And that helps you start tying the things together, right? Who you wanna be, is demonstrated through your behaviors, which is how you are. And that's what people see. That's how you model behavior for your um, family, your kids, your coworkers, your employees. So think about that a little bit. What do you want? What is your end result? What is that desired outcome? So the desired outcome is the thing that pulls you forward. It's kind of the aspiration. Where am I going with the things I'm doing? What would be ideal at the end of that road? What would you like your life to be? What do you want? What are the things that go with that? Is it a fancy car? Is it a fancy house? Is it a tiny house? Is it all the freedom in the world to live out of a backpack and travel around the world? Is it simply to have more time to spend with your family. It doesn't matter what you want. It's what you want. And I have a firm belief that you will not desire something that you are not really meant to have. Um, and I think society pulls us back in. We want something so big or so huge that we don't even have any experience with that. And then we reel ourselves back in. I can't possibly get that because it's out of my reach. It's out of my realm. Well, it may take many steps to get there, but I believe anything is possible if you want it. Um, now, having said that, you still have to do some tasks and produce some things and have a plan and execute on the plan and implement the behaviors that go along with getting that thing, if it's a thing. But again, if you are experiencing the little bits of satisfaction along the way by completing the small, getting the same feeling by completing some of the smaller things along the way, you're golden, man. It, it all is becomes enjoyable. You feel productive at the end of the day. You feel satisfied with how things went. You are calmer. You are more interesting. Um, all of it works better together. I think there's a big disconnect in people these days that... They can't possibly have that, or it's out of reach, or I shouldn't want that, instead of being innovative and trying to figure out how to get that um, in a legitimate way. <laughs> um, you know, some of us can go into the, I think I could do that if I just, I'm, I'm kind of a wild thinker and storyteller. So I often spin off into that would make a great movie type scenarios, but not reality. So how do you figure out how to bring it into the reality? And that's when you start thinking about what behaviors and actions are required to get me there, right? What what I need to do to get this thing I want? What small activities can I track on my way to prove to myself I'm getting closer? Now, not everybody reacts great to tracking things with like a thermometer or um, some sort of chart or graph. Some people barely can deal with putting stars on a calendar, but there's a reason. These are tried and true tracking devices. It's so that you get the feedback that you are capable of doing the things necessary to get the thing you want, whether it is a feeling or a thing or your successful, um, you know, how you've envisioned your success. All of those things can be tracked in one way or another. And it's an important skill to develop. This is one of the reasons they say making your bed in the morning can really help you um, achieve more because you have a quick win 
early in the morning. You didn't have to think about it very much. We're going to talk a little bit more about that and how you bring actions into your day and your week that help you get there. The Streamline Clutter Solution online course will help you gain control of your stuff and space. What are you waiting for? The link's around here somewhere. Um, we talked about what success looks like. And we also had talked before about what you enjoy about your work, what kinds of things bring you satisfaction in work in terms of what tasks you work on and what parts of your brain or body you, you might be using for that. Um, and one more piece to the what success looks like for you. Um, we were talking about how just making your bed in the morning can provide a, a positive feedback loop to your brain that you can be successful in other things as well. And that leads me to, to remind, especially my women viewers, that women have a hard time celebrating our successes. And, you know, men play sports a lot more. I'm, I'm making complete generalizations. I played sports myself. So in sports, you're taught to celebrate your victories, a good play, good sportsmanship, whatever went into it, a great practice, a certain amount of effort, they celebrate. They celebrate their wins. They celebrate their scores. And women will be like, oh, it was no big deal. Oh, yeah, it's just what I do. And that can lead to dissatisfaction and resentment in the long run. So by all means, prop yourself up. Give yourself props. Celebrate, even if it's just little something little. I do a happy dance whenever I'm trying to do something that I haven't done before and it goes well. I, you know, might have a lovely cocktail at the end of the day to celebrate a success. I might go out to eat. I might just go outside and stand in the sun, but do something legitimately that celebrates your successes and toot your own horn. Bosses do not notice when you've done something good unless you tell them you did something good or how much effort went into that. I hear my um, women friends all the time talk about other people taking credit for something that they had done themselves. And so make sure to speak up to your own horn and get used to celebrating whatever it is. It just makes things happier. You know, it releases dopamine in your brain when you smile or laugh or dance. And so that's the other reason you wanna do it. It makes you feel better, even when you're depressed. I suffer from depression um, fairly often. <laughs> um, it's fairly mild, but just smiling and doing something of celebratory nature can really make a difference. Okay, so now that we've talked about celebrations, how do you know when and what to celebrate? Well, you gotta have a plan of, of action, right? And people are always asking me, well, what's the best schedule? How do I get it all done? What should I work on next? It's all a big mystery. But now that you've started figuring out what you like to work on, how you like to work on it, why it's going to help you get the thing you would like to have happen to be successful, and what you want in terms of things, you now have some actual parameters, some constraints, if you will, about what you can fit into your week. And it's amazing to me that people will schedule a bunch of little busy work at the expense of sleep or eating, or fitness, because those things help your brain reset and regroup and recharge so that you have the energy to do the things you need to do that involve more um, deep work, or learning something new, or being creative, or having patience with your family. So you're tanking your own desires by working on the wrong things at the right wrong times. So if you start with a list of what you want and the activities that you're gonna need to do that, and you have your, um, so you have a universe of things you need to do. Then there's a kind of simple three-step process for starting to have a more satisfying week based on the behaviors you're gonna be doing, the activities you're gonna participate in. The very first thing is you have to do a little bit of tracking. What are you actually working on? And what does your actual week look like? People tell me all the time they're so busy, they don't have time to do something. But when they start mapping out what they actually worked on each day, there's lots of little pieces of time that are being um, wasted by having to refocus because of interruptions or refocus because they're running in circles or perhaps shopping every day or playing on Facebook every day. You know, there's different 
levels, I'm not saying any of these things are bad, but does it fit in with what you want your life to be, um, can really help. So you have to orient again within your actual schedule. What do I work on every week? And is it enough to get the job done? Is it too much? Am I working on the wrong thing? So you got to, you know, just figure out what your actual week looks like. Then you can start complaining about all the things. <laughs> Cause I'm telling you right now, you don't know all the things you're doing every week. Um, the next thing is to kind of figure out your capacity. <clears throat> and I have my clients do this by actually backing out the things that have to happen. It's a, an attempt to layer your schedule in a way that allows you to get the most done um, in the with the least amount of effort. So you got to schedule in your sleep. Um, and don't skimp on this. I actually sleep between seven and a half and nine hours every night, usually seven and a half. But um, you have to actually pencil in when you're going to sleep. You have to actually write down when you're going to eat. If eating healthy is more important to you so that you live longer and, and have more energy, you got to schedule it. You have to schedule the time that you have to um, do the things that allow you to do the rest of your things. So you have to schedule in a little bit of time for planning, a little bit of time for laundry and chores or housework. And even if you um, sub those out, even if you have a housekeeper or your kids do the laundry or whatever, you still have to manage that. So you're going to want to have at least some sort of check-in um, time scheduled on your calendar to make sure those things are working. The time that takes to go to the, the store to pick up the things you need to live at your house. Um, the time to get the gas to be able to, to drive and things. And there's ways to make those easier. And we're not going to go into that today, but this is the layer into your schedule, the things that have to happen to be able to do the rest of your life. This is where people go wrong. They schedule the other stuff first, and then they wonder how to get all the rest of the little stuff they don't enjoy doing done. So we're talking about this in the way, like the analogy of getting a big vase and putting in the big rocks. The big rocks are taking care of yourself. The big rocks are the things that are gonna help you um, have the energy to do the other things. The next size rocks are a little bit smaller, and those are the tasks that involve um, kind of the, the um, commitments you've made, whether it's getting a kid to school or to an appointment or a doctor's appointment or a meeting with the bank. Those are the commitments. So those are the next size rocks that go onto your schedule. We'll talk more about this schedule when we come back. I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino. This is the Streamlined Connection and we're on the Bold Brave TV network. We'll be right back. Get the Streamlined Paper Solution online course and learn quick ways to control interesting information. The link's here. Before the break, we were talking about how to figure out what to work on and when. And we started by figuring out your actual work week, what you're, what you're actually working on. Um, and then we started talking about your capacity. And the capacity has to be the things that have to happen and then the things you committed to happen and then you get to layer in some periods of deeper work. But this is a good chance to take a look at that actual schedule and see what you can let go of. What things aren't necessary or aren't getting you towards that desired outcome or the success you want that are irrelevant. They're just time wasters. That's what busy work is. The things that seem important in the moment but don't actually get you to those goals. So let go of those things to free up some capacity. And then I want you to do an ideal week. This is where you get to imagine something different. If all things being equal, you made enough money, other people weren't necessarily involved, um, what would your ideal week look like? How much time would you put aside for working out? How much time would you set aside for reading? How much time would you set aside for going out in nature or gardening? How much time would you set aside for um, shopping? Is that really something you want to spend a lot of time on or not? Would you be writing a book? Would you be researching something? Would you be learning something new? This is the part that doesn't happen for people. They think they have all this work to do and then they don't put any enjoyment into their um, week. So the goal here is to know your actual week 
the stuff you've been working on is just busy work and your ideal schedule. And then you start merging. You start taking out more busy work and putting in stuff you like to do into that um, actual week, right? So if you don't really want to be shopping because it's not getting you what you really want, except for that 30 seconds when you initially make the purchase, what if you could re replace that dopamine hit with something you actually enjoy and gets you towards that desired outcome? That would be better, right? I think you should look into that. <laughs> it's how you want to spend your time. What Do you want to be known as that person that shopped really well or played excellent video games? I play a lot of video games, but it's a, on a time limit. I don't spend hours and hours and hours. I spend five and 10 minutes here and there. So take a look at that. Start doing more of what you want, less of what you don't want, and your day will change. It will feel more satisfying and fulfilling to you. Now to make all this happen and still get it all done, you really have to figure out how to make as many of the things you have to do, those things that allow you to live the life, the laundry, the chores, the food, the, the cleaning up, um, the sleeping, <laughs> all of these things actually can be turned into habits, which means your brain doesn't have to spend as much energy thinking about them, complaining about them, wasting time trying to get out of them. They just kind of happen automatically. It's like brushing your teeth or making your coffee in the morning. You don't have to think that through on a super conscious level. You just go, uh, time to brush my teeth. I get up, I walk to the bathroom, I brush my teeth, I go make the coffee, whatever order you do your routine in. Same thing when you drive. You don't have to think about all the steps it takes to drive your car, right? You just get in your car, you may put your seatbelt on first, you might put the key in first, you might adjust the mirrors, whatever it is you do, to get ready to drive, you do that without thinking. So you wanna turn as many of the chores as possible into habit loops, habit routines that you don't have to think so much about. Oh, Monday, I need to do laundry. Here's what I do to do laundry and you just start your laundry routine and it kind of runs while you're doing other things. So this is, um, a process that you may not remember how you developed some of your habits and some of your habits may be bad and you might want to adjust them. So I want to tell you about the way you do that. There's four steps, three ish <laughs> steps to creating a good habit loop. You have to have that intention. What is that desired outcome on the other end? Why are you even creating this habit and how is success going to look? That's kind of the intention. I intend to pay attention to this new thing for a while so that what gets to happen. That's what an intention is. It's your um, commitment to pay attention to a certain activity over and over and over till it becomes a habit so that you get a different result farther down the timeline on that road to success. You have to pay attention to it. So how are you going to pay attention to it? What is going to cue you to start that activity? Is it, it's Monday, so it's laundry day. Is it, I just woke up, so now I'm going to go brush my teeth and make my coffee. Is it, I just fed the cat, so now I got to take my vitamins. Where is the cue to start a thing? And in the early days, it may be a rubber band on your wrist. It may be an alarm on your phone. It may be putting it on the calendar. It may be post-it notes all over your house. I don't know. What helps you learn to do the behavior? Um, that's how you pay attention. Now, perseverance is the next thing. This is the practice. You have to practice new things or things being tried in a different way or try to become a habit even if it's something you do, you can do, but you have to think through all the steps. When we learn anything new, you have to think through the steps. So perseverance comes from the practice of that behavior, that actual action over and over and over. It then becomes muscle memory. Your body starts to remember what happens next and it begins to flow. It's like learning choreography. What do I do next? What's the next step? How do I repeat it? What's going to trigger that? And how is it getting me to my goal? See, I'm always connecting each piece of the process so that you can see that just by repeating it helps you learn how to do it. Um, and the piece we touched on a minute ago, the celebration. 
when you do something a certain number of times or you reach your your desired outcome for that piece of your puzzle, what's the reward going to be? How are you going to celebrate? This is what releases the dopamine. It makes your brain remember that you are good at it. You've done it. You can do more. You um, don't need a lot of external things. You just need to know how you work in the world, right? So here's where things go um, can go off the rails just a little bit. And we'll, we'll probably pick this up after the break. But you have to know how many times you're going to do something. And the reward comes from the completion of the thing, not from um, having done it entirely. Get the Streamlined Paper Solution online course and learn quick ways to control interesting information. The link's here. And before the break, we were talking a little bit about how rewo the reward system works to help you develop a new habit. Um, and I just want to go over that again, because it is definitely one of the most complicated um, things to grasp. Uh, it's actually a threshold concept that takes a while to, to fully understand. It was one of the hardest things I had to learn. So what it's about is providing that dopamine hit for making the effort towards the new habit. So it's the completion. So let's say you're rewarding your workout habit. It is not that you were perfect and worked out every day for 30 days. It is that you did four out of five workouts every week for the last four weeks. It's the completion. You may not have lifted the amount of weight. You may not have um, gotten the physique you actually envisioned at the end of that time, but you put in the effort to do that activity every time or a, a certain number of uh, times within a, a range that gets you the reward. Okay, so then that brings me to what does organized look like to you? What does a habit help you create? I have a couple habits. I'm just gonna return to the one because most people can can um, understand it or, or um, resonate with it. I have a laundry room that is tiny and it's in my bathroom and I have to actually move the things off my washer to the counter in the bathroom so that they don't jiggle off when I actually run the washer. So it seems like a lot of extra busy work, but it actually allows me to think through the laundry thing. I move the laundry booster, I move the detergent, I move the stain fighter to the um, counter, and now I have room to work with it. But for some people, it'd be like, oh my gosh, you have to move that every time you do laundry. And it's like once a week, I move four things to the other counter and then I put them back. So you have to figure out what organized looks like to you. Um, and there is a method to each of our madnesses and work with that. Okay, so the last kind of piece of how to figure out focus and habits and joy at work, in working, at home, at a job, on a project, all of it. So it's it's the micro from the macro. You have to be able to come back and forth uh, between what the big picture vision is and the details that help you get there. And for some processing, so, you know, we each process information in a different way. There's three basic ways we process information. A lot to go into, so I'm just gonna touch on it right now. If you are the kind of person that that is easiest for, which is the smallest group of people out there looking at the big picture and then taking it to the small details and zooming back out. Um, you're going to be either a big picture thinker or a small uh, detail thinker. And so if you are one of those, you just have to practice. We all have the capacity to be able to be better at being able to zoom out and zoom in on what we're working on. Um, so you'll just need to practice. You know who you are. If you get caught up in checklists and um, really can't think of what to work on next without it being on a list, you're a detail person. If you are always thinking of the story and or trying to get out of things and uh, making up stories about how you're going to work and when you're going to work and then you never actually do the work because you're making up the stories, you're a bigger picture thinker. So you need to bring it down to how do I make myself do some things and reward system is one of the ways you can do that. Um, now, we have to also kind of understand the difference between a decision and a choice. 
Um, and I actually want to just redo the definitions because this is something that I just made an extra aha about earlier in the week and I want to share it with you. So a decision is actually a conclusion or resolution based on having researched and considered things and how they interact with other things. So a consideration is, is it gonna work for me? Is this serving me? Is this getting me closer to my desired outcome? That would be a decision. I make the decision that I wanna eat healthier so that I can, and what's that desired outcome? That's a decision. The choice is which of the decisions you choose to work on. So it's the act of selecting or making a decision when faced with possibilities and if you've already made a decision, you get a better outcome because you made a decision based on consideration and careful planning that now it becomes an automatic choice in your brain. That's why you want to create habits, to create those automatic behaviors when faced with a choice. This is happening in, in milliseconds. It is literally one one hundredth of a second to make a choice out of things you've already experienced, considered, and may be decided upon. And the way our brains work is most of it happens unconsciously. That donut didn't kill you, so you're going to have another donut next time you're faced with donuts because it didn't kill you. But if you decide you're not going to eat donuts anymore or you're only going to have one donut a week, you can now say no easier because you made the choice based on experience that I don't need that donut, not I didn't die from that donut. See where I'm going with that? It's really important so that every time you put something new on your schedule, it's coming from a place of choosing based on a decision you made about how you want to live your life and how you want to work, how you get satisfaction in your day and your um, work and your space and your mind. All of it starts working together when you take the time to plan and create and understand how it all works. Um, you know, not making a decision is a decision in and of itself, and it quickly becomes the choice. I choose to live my life without putting my stuff away when I first get home from the store. So the bags pile up and things become disorganized and I can't find the thing I just needed and I go back to the store and now I've brought more stuff into the house that I didn't put away right away because I chose not to do it by default. But what if you say, I'm in control of my space. I have decided I'm gonna be a more organized person. I'm going to be better each and every day in my organization. Now I'm gonna practice coming home and putting the things away right away. I take them out of the bag, I put the bag away, I cut the tags off of the things, I throw the packaging or recycle the packaging as soon as possible, things where they go. And now I have some order in my everyday life and I get to reward myself because I did what I intended to do, which was live a more organized life by putting things away when I first get back from the store and doing it to completion. So now I get a little reward at the end of the completion. You can track it by checking it off a list and that's how you develop new habits that serve your life. Get the Streamline Time Solution online course and learn easy ways to control your time and tasks. Links here somewhere, down there I think. What, you know, people often say, I want more money, for what? You know, I'm all about helping you build wealth through organization and I'm a lot about money mindset and how it affects all the different areas of your life. So when you say things like, I can't afford that, it's not from the same place of power um, and knowledge as if you say, I choose not to buy that right now. I choose other priorities. I've made a decision that these are the things I'm going to allow into my life. These are the things I'm going to work with. These are the things I'm going to work on. And now you've made a decision instead of a default choice of saying you can't afford it which makes you feel smaller and doesn't help with the dopamine. And then it may cause you to use one of your bad behaviors, for lack of a better word, your less desirable behaviors to kind of soothe yourself for the fact that you don't feel great. 
But if you say something simple, like I've made a decision that I don't do that anymore, or I've made a decision that I'm not spending money on that right now, at this point in the process, it doesn't say that you can never buy that in the future. It just says right now, right here. And so you can focus on the thing you're actually trying to focus on and do that to its completion and then you reevaluate. And each time you do that, you may be making better decisions and you may be opening possibility for more money because you have put yourself back in control of what and how you spend your time, your money and your energy. That's why everything is connected. That's why it can feel overwhelming when you don't have a plan and stuff just comes at you and you are reacting to it with choices based on past experience that pretty much are only triggered by the fact that you haven't died yet because that's how our subconscious brain works. It goes all the way back to the savannah and it keeps us from being eaten by hyenas. And um, it's not a great way to live now. You get to make more choices, but you have to put in the effort of developing the habits of making better ch choices. So don't forget, you can start one of these better choices right now by downloading the one minute mail solution at morethanorganized.net slash mail dash in dash one. Um, and that can help you start a better habit right away about dealing with your mail and email. As always, um, comments, questions, and feedback are always welcome. And you can send those to Miriam at morethanorganized.net. And next time I get to talk to my good friend, Amy Payne of Lasting Order. She specializes in helping businesses find um, solutions for their productivity. She's a whiz at CRMs and um, productivity solutions, but she also deals a lot with moves and moving systems. So I'm excited to talk to her. We'll see which way the, the uh, discussion leads us, but as always, tell all your friends because getting organized and expanding your mind is always more fun when someone else is around. We're in this together. And you can visit morethanorganized.net for all the different um, blogs and topics I talk about here. There's more resources available there.